So the outline for the talk today, I'll just give a brief introduction to what exactly is adopterance that I've been repeating uh, so far. Then um, I'm trying to I'll try and advocate why is there a need to improve or why is there a need for bioinformatics uh, in, in the context of di diversity, biodiversity. Um, then we move on to how to improve it. And lastly, um, I've been in Philippines for the past four days, three, four days. So I'm just going to show what I plan to do in, in relation to improving bio, bioinformatics of autoterrans in Southeast Asia and particularly in Philippines. So autoterrans or autoptera is an order of insects comprising of um, the crickets, the kittidids and grasshoppers. So this is a phylogeny of um, the this is a phylogeny of the autoptera and you can see that here is actually referring to the to the grasshoppers, they form a monophyletic group. And then the other suborder, which is the Ancipera, consisting of the crickets and catidids, they form a different um, monophyletic group. That's why um, they, they are two, uh, two suborders. There are about 27,000 species, more than 27,000 species uh, globally. In Southeast Asia, we know of about slightly more than 2,000 species, but um, this number is really just an underestimation. So the reason why it is diverse and is underestimated is because it can be found in a diverse, uh, different type of environments. So typically, we know that it can be found in forests and grasshoppers, uh, forests and grasslands. Um, but places like mangrove and intertidal zones are also places. Are also you can also find uh, autochthon. So this particular cricket on the right. Um, they are only found on a particular species of mangrove plants uh, in Singapore so far. Um, then on the left, this cricket is found on the seashore. So what happens is that um, during the high tide, they will form burrows and then they will hide under, uh, in the burrow. And then when low tides comes, um, they will emerge and then they start feeding on debris that, that, that was left behind from the tide. Uh, even though autochthonous are terrestrial organisms, uh, we do see them uh, found very near to the water, some groups are actually uh, what we call semi-aquatic. So they can actually dive into the water to escape predators, or they actually feed on algae that are found underwater. And of course, uh, with increasing urbanization, uh, we still can find some species that somehow manage to adapt in our very concrete environment. So, um, People always ask me why do I study autopterans. So, uh, scientific answer to scientific answer to this is that it's ecologically important. And why is it ecologically important is because uh, it plays different roles in the ecosystem. So, we generally associate grasshoppers and herbivores, uh, but they are more than just herbivores. So, they are species that uh, feed on a very specialized uh, group of organisms. So, so some species feed only on flowers. And in the process of feeding on flowers, it actually helps to pollinate them. So this, this actually forms part of my uh, thesis work. Um, of course, they are also prey to larger organisms. So recently, we found out that in civil cats, as well as uh, leopard cats in Singapore, uh, these two mammals actually love a doctor. So in their gut content, they can actually found many, many species of a huge abundance of them. Um, but at the same time, they are actually predators to other insects. So um, this this KCD is actually feeding on the termite and it's actually actively preying. So it actually uh, hunt them down. Uh, in the same place in Thailand, uh, other species actually also feed on frogs. So those frogs are small, uh, but but they still actively uh, predate on them. So I'm going to show you a short video of. Uh, of this KTD feeding on the flower in the laboratory. So um, instead of just chewing everything and destroying everything, what they actually do is they pick pollen using their maxillary part, which is like their small fingers on their mouth. So they pick the pollen and then but they actually do doesn't damage the plant parts. So in the process and because they are pretty messy eater as well, so in the process they can actually help to pollinate the, the plant important and they are adapted to special uh, niche specialized niche um, they can actually 
provide a bio, potential bioindicator for us. So bioindicator means uh, we want to see how this organism can tell us about the environment. Um, some work has already been done in Europe and uh, the North America. Unfortunately, in Southeast Asia, we don't use them. Typically, we use uh, the odonata, the butterflies, and so on. But for autopterans, because we really lack information about the ecology, um, so we, we, we can't really use them for bioindicator, but there are potential. So like I mentioned, some species are found uh, near the streams. These, these are some of them. They, they are known as pygmy grasshoppers. Um, they, they, they like the water. And we did some survey, and then we can actually associate them with specific micro, micro habitat. So by doing that, uh, we can actually show that uh, we can actually provide some indication of whether the environment is suitable, uh, especially in the swamp forest where we surveyed um, drying environment is actually a bad indication of uh, the future for the swamp, swamp forest. Another reason why it's important to study autopterans is because they are uh, economic pests. So they damage crops, um, especially for countries that rely on agriculture for the economy. These are, these are big problems. Uh, but it's important to note that uh, as a defender of autopterans, I have to say that uh, there's only a few species that are uh, really damaging to the agriculture. So typically there are those that form uh, local swamps. So these are only just a few, a, a small percentage of the entire diversity of autopterans. Um, a, a more recent, um, re a more recent importance of autopterans is that uh, with growing uh, population, increasing food demand, uh, problem with climate change, people are looking at alternative protein source uh, for humans. So instead of beef, chicken, uh, which actually has a very high carbon footprint, we are we are now looking at uh, insects for food. And autopterans is one of them because um, they are nutritious, they are high in omega-3, which uh, for human beings, we are obtaining them only from the fish. So um, we know that fish is also um, over-exploited. So this is a potential uh, lifesaver for, for, the, for the Earth. So then I move on to why do we need uh, bioinformatics. So I come up with two reasons. Uh, first is the biodiversity crisis. So we know about biodiversity crisis. Um, population, uh, human, humans, uh, growing, pop growing population of humans uh, means that we need more resources. So we are clearing a lot of forests, clearing a lot of native natural environment, um, and these are bad for our species. So many species are going extinct. Um, we are going into the sixth mass extinction. Um, so that is one reason why we need to uh, know what exactly are there in, in the wild and how can we do, what can we do to protect them. So we need to know enough to be able to protect them. Um, so this encompasses the biodiversity crisis. The second reason is more of a human reason, which is the taxonomy crisis. Uh, what I mean here is that uh, taxonomy as a science, uh, taxonomies as a professional, um, is going extinct too, together with the animals and plants. So we know, uh, people in the university will know that it's very hard to get funding for, for work in taxonomy. Um, it's not attractive. A lot of young students are no longer interested in the traditional morphology. Um, so it becomes a problem because people can no longer identify them. Um, they can barcode them, they can sequence them, uh, but when you give them a specimen, they don't know what it is. So this becomes a problem because without these taxonomies, um, we can't do what we need to do. Um, other areas of science like ecology, behavior, uh, conservation biology, they all need the, the taxonomy to tell them what is a species, uh, what encompasses a species, and how to identify them. So um, um, this is the reason why I think uh, we need bioinformatics and uh, a liter literature review uh, looking at species, uh, the type locality of all the species that have been described from Southeast Asia. So I uh, map them using GIS software to see um, where are they actually found, where are these new species being found. Um, so you can see from this map, this is a map of Southeast Asia, Philippines is here. Um, the red border just demarcate uh, um, the biodiversity hotspots. So you can see that the entire Southeast Asia is actually uh, made up of numerous biodiversity hotspots. And 
the darker the shading means that there are more new species that have been discovered. So you can see that actually it's not very well sampled. Some places are very um, are very well sampled and then there's many many species being discovered. But some areas like Kalimantan is totally empty, Laos they are totally empty. So there are different reasons why nobody are there to collect and to study the apocalypse there. Um, secondly, it's also that if you look at this graph, so this graph is the cumulative number of species that is described uh, over over time, over, over the years. And you can see that since 1980s, the species being discovered are actually soaring. So uh, if, all, if we actually know all the species uh, in Southeast Asia, then the graph should end up with the two. But here we are seeing that it is shooting up. So it means that there are still many species that we do not know of and are still waiting to be discovered. Um, is that um, all these new species that have been discovered, usually there is a type specimen or holotype. Um, these holotypes are usually collected by foreign, uh, foreign foreigners. Uh, by what I mean foreigners means Europeans and uh, um, uh, Europeans and Americans because I'm also a foreigner here. Um, <laughs> uh, so the Europes and Americans, they were colonial master uh, of Southeast Asia. So the, the scientists came, they collect, they bring the specimens back, they describe new species, and then the specimens are left in their museums. So you can see that um, in the Philippines, most of the species were described and then they were left in American university, uh, American museums. Uh, from where I come from is where British, we, we, uh, Singapore used to be under British, so many of our specimens are, end up, uh, are now in the British Museum. So different parts of Southeast Asia, you can see that Germany, Netherlands, Russia, UK and US, um, they have most of the species uh, most of the type specimens with them. So for locals, for Southeast Asians like us who want to study uh, autopteran, we need to look at the specimens, uh, to look at the type specimens to identify it. It becomes a problem. Uh, we cannot, some of us cannot afford to travel, to spend so much money traveling to Europe uh, to look at the specimen. So this, this becomes a problem for us uh, to, to improve ourselves as well, to improve uh, our knowledge of the biodiversity in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, in, in my humble opinion, I come up with two solutions uh, to improving bioinformatics. But I'm sure everybody knows that this this is how we can improve. So the first part is to improve our science. Um, so from here onwards, I'm just bragging about what I have done uh, for the past few years. But really, the part the the work of autopterans in Southeast Asia is not just uh, it's not just done by me. There is um, there are many many experts all around the world working on it. So I'm just showing what I've found, uh, what, what I've done, um, and hopefully it becomes a, 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 it can become something that we can learn from one another. So going to science, um, like I mentioned, there are still many species that we do not know, still waiting to be discovered and described. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to do more sampling and then try and identify, describe the new species. So uh, it, in, in some universities, including mine, um, there are people working on insects. But the students, after they finish their final year project, um, they have interesting results. But because after their final year results, they graduated, they left, and then the specimens are left in the museum untouched, nobody cares about it anymore. So, um, but it could have new species inside if someone actually continues working on it. Uh, again, it leads back to um, the fact that taxonomies are going extinct as well. Um, in, in addition to just describing species after species, uh, it's also important to uh, look at what people have done. Um, chances are is that with new technology that we have now, um, people who describe species in the past would have some limitations. Some it could be because um, the description is poorly written or that um, there's a lot of synonymies. That means species that are actually the same species, but they actually describe separate species. So we need to revise, do revision, improve on what people have done, and then come up with a new systematic for a particular a specific group. And in the process, uh, we should always try to, try to um, create taxonomy keys. 
So taxonomy keys uh, usually in dichotomous um, is useful in the sense that people can actually use them to identify species. So instead of looking through the description, which can be very detailed, can be very boring, um, you can use a key to help you to identify them. Some researchers, they are very good at describing species, but coming up, coming up with a key to help with identification is another thing. Uh, and, and yeah, it can be a, um, yeah. Uh, so, in, in addition to doing taxonomy itself, uh, I feel that um, whenever we sample a particular area, you, you, it's always good to come out with a species checklist. So, a species checklist is something very basic. Some people don't even consider it as a science, they consider it as a stem collection. Um, but, at the same time, we need a species checklist because um, if the government decided to clear the land, um, it's always good to have a species checklist to tell them what species are there, um, what impact um, the, the activity could have on, on the species, not yeah, on the species. So, um, species checklist is something very basic. At the same time, for someone who do ecological work, uh, it's actually very crucial to have a species checklist because it saves up a lot of trouble trying to uh, identify their specimens. So for example, an ecologist working in Mount Makiling. If Mount Makiling has a species checklist for autopterans, um, all he needs to do is to look at the checklist and he pinpoint um, what specimen, what species he has from his, his collection. But if, he, if there is no species checklist for Mount Makiling, then he probably needs to look at uh, all the species in Philippines, um, all the species in Luzon. And then um, that will take up a lot more time. I went to different countries, four countries so far, uh, five countries including Philippines now. So I have been describing species. Um, so I'm going to just hi uh, show you all some highlights. And, and yeah. So the highlights for this page is that we actually can discover 30 species uh, of autopterans that are new to science from Singapore. So Singapore has about 200, more than 250 species of autopterans in total. And 30 of them are actually new to science and it was only described recently. So it's not uh, because Singapore is a center of uh, speciation, no. It's just because nobody actually studied them previously. So when we started doing collection, we find a lot of species that nobody has seen before, and then we, later on we found out that yeah, they are actually undescribed. Yet at the same time, Singapore being so small, is also um, clear, clearing a lot of forest and natural environment for <coughs> autoterrans and other organisms. So in, in uh, last year when I went to Brunei, um, I went to a very small place, um, it's just a few stations, uh, probably smaller than the, the, the area that I sampled is probably smaller than the campus here, uh, but yet at the same time I can also find many species that are new to science. So from a single tribe of, uh, tribe of ketidids, so these are ketidids from the tribe Makono. Macona, Martini, Tini, um, they look small and they are small and delicate. So they are usually very skinny, but um, they are actually predatory as well. So they are forest specialists and they are very specialized in where they are found. They don't, uh, they, they can't fly very well, they can't migrate very far, so they are, um, their distribution is actually very restricted. So that's why we can actually find species that look very different even within a single site. Um, for this species of candidates, it's very easy if you look at the morphology. Usually we look at the genitalia, so that involves some dissection, um, but in general, morphology tells a lot about the species. Uh, we can use the genitalia to infer uh, reproductive evidence for reproductive isolation. That, that allows us to define a species based on the biological species concept. Um, but not all species are so straightforward. So some species can look really similar morphologically, even when we dissect the genitalia, it might look slightly different, but it could. It's hard to tell whether it's um, intra or in interspecific variation. So, um, here are two examples. Uh, because autopterans, they actually produce sound. The males produce sound to attract females of the same species. So, we know that different species have different sound. Um, they sound differently. So, um, 
by using the sound, we can actually sound can actually provide information on whether a, spec uh, a species are they the same or different. So sometimes it can actually help us to uh, discover cryptic species. Cryptic species means that they look morphologically identical, but uh, there are different aspects that they are different. So uh, typically people use DNA to find out cryptic species, but for autopterans, because they produce sounds, um, we can also use their acoustic. From Singapore, where um, within Singapore, there's actually two species of this cricket, and they look very similar in the morphology, but uh, when we actually look at the recorded the sound, it, it's actually very different. Uh, you can see from the sonogram. So, yeah, so these are one example. Um, nowadays, uh, more recently, people are talking about this thing called integrative taxonomy. So. Um, in the past, people just look at the morphology and then they describe it, and that, that is what we call traditional taxonomy. But nowadays, people um, to advocate taxonomy, they come up with this thing called integrative taxonomy, which means they integrate different kind of data. So what I have done previously in the previous slide about using sound and morphology, that is also a form of integrative taxonomy. But typically, people use integrative taxonomy. Um, when they actually do some sequencing. So in this case, these are uh, two species of um, tetragates or pygmy grasshoppers that was found that were found in uh, the swamp forest in Singapore. So we have a very small patch of swamp forest, um, and they are actually symmetric. That means they actually occur uh, together. So when I looked at the morphology, I couldn't actually find any differences in the morphology. So, but when I sequence out uh, the CO1, I can actually see that they form two clades and they are both well supported. You all can't really see the push of everybody, it's well supported. Um, when I did some morphometric analysis, which means I do some measurement with the morphology, um, there are actually differences as well. So, by summarizing it using a PCA or multivariate analysis, we can actually see that but because they are not overlapping, um, there are distinct differences in the morphometry. The last thing that I did was that um, I actually also quantified the habitat that they are found in. So um, we found that one species tend to be found in more grassy area and the other species tend to be found in more muddy areas. So um, the fact that they occupy different niche is also a, a evidence that they are actually uh, two different species. Uh, so I think I mentioned it a bit just now about how um, keys are important in addition to just having species description. So, um, but at the same time, there are many keys out there in the literature, but not all of them are useful at, as well. So, what I mean by useful is that it can actually uh, it's easy to understand. Um, it has pictures to help you, uh, as well as uh, it's not ambiguous. So, some keys. Uh, in each point, there's only one one character, and then you and then you found a species that is not describing either of that character, and then you are totally lost. So it's always important to have more than one character as a form of verification. Uh, pictures, I think, is important because it speaks a thousand words, uh, or maybe more. Um, yeah. So uh, these are um, these. Uh, so another point is that. Um, Many keys are published in uh, journals articles, uh, but at the same time, many journal articles are, are not freely available to, to everyone. So some university might not have subscribed a particular journal and then the student will not be able to access those journals. Um, but nowadays, people are moving towards uh, online keys, keys that are found uh, on the internet and then everybody can access it for free. So here is an example of a key, a online key that is it's actually a software that helps you to create online keys uh, and then you can publish it in your website, you can publish it inside your, your article as well but it is meant to be more interactive than just looking through a paper um, and of course they expect you to come out with pictures, allow you to put in pictures to help with your key. So species checklist. Um, I mentioned just now about um, when someone wants, when the government wants to clear the forest and then um, we, we need some information about the biodiversity. 
Um, an example for, from Singapore is that um, in a forest patch right beside our nature reserve, the government decided to clear it and then put a park and some ecotourism, uh, some adventure park at, at the forest site. Um, and they portray it as a form of conservation. What we did was that we went to survey to see what species can be found there, different taxa. Um, and surprisingly, even though it's not really part of the forest reserve, uh, we can actually find new species as well. And these are really small crickets, uh, maybe less than an mm. Yeah, less than an mm. No, sorry, less than 5 mm. Um, and they are found under tree barks. So you actually have to peel off the tree bark uh, and then you'll see them running around. So, and they're really small, they can't fly, even though they have wings. Their wings are only meant to produce sound, they can't use it to fly. So, uh, we can expect that if the, if the trees are gone, uh, they're probably going to go extinct. Um, but maybe they can be found in other places, I, I don't know. Um, so, species checklist also, um, yeah. Um, like I mentioned that um, species, a lot of papers are not freely available to everyone simply because um, the journals actually restrict access. So uh, what I try to do sometimes is also to publish in um, open access journals. So that makes it um, a lot more accessible for everyone to use it. So these are some examples of checklist articles that I wrote. Uh, instead of just coming out with a checklist, um, I have pictures for each species, I come out with a key for the species, so that will help people to identify whenever they want to work on the autopterance in, in the particular area. So in the process of sampling, um, there's always interesting findings that we can uh, that, that review itself while we are trying to um, have other, other aims. So here is an example. Uh, again, it's from Singapore. CN uh, status, so it can range from Critically, uh, from extinct to, to endangered and threatened. So this Katydids is the only two species of Autopterans that is found there, uh, simply, simply because we, we don't, don't really know them. Uh, and the reason why they put it in the book is because it was described in 1922 by an English, English man, and then he brought a, again he brought a specimen back to the uh, British. Uh, and since then, nobody has seen it before. Um, so based on that, they declare it as uh, extinct. But at the same time, when they are actually doing survey, they found another species, this species. And then it's actually very common in Singapore forest. Uh, but because you can see that this species has a wing, and this species actually doesn't have a long wing, it has a truncated wing. So people know that it's different, just that um, they have no idea what it is. So it turns out that uh, this species is actually undescribed since a long, long time ago. Um, and then, through most surveys, we actually found this, uh, this species again. So it's actually not extinct. Uh, and because this species was, and that was considered endemic to Singapore, so when they declare it extinct, it's actually globally extinct. Uh, but of course, now we know that it is actually, it still can be found in the forest of Singapore. Uh, and it's not that rare as well. So this shows that um, we've continued continued surveys and studies, uh, we can know more about the species that we previously wouldn't have known. Um, this is something that I'm, I'm interested in, uh, species distribution model, so I thought I would just share with you all what it's about. Um, so this is actually a software or, a, or an analytic tools that people use to understand the distribution of species. So we know that it's very hard to survey the entire region or the entire world uh, thoroughly. There's no way we can do it. Uh, so we use models to help us predict what is the, what is the uh, distribution of a particular species. So what we usually do is that we use uh, specimen data, and all this specimen data comes from the museum. All the collections that is done from long time ago to now, they become important uh, information, uh, the label that you see in each specimen they are very important because we, now people are relying on these labels to, uh, to do more things. So if you are an entomological student uh, and you are expected to pin specimens and label them, make sure you do it properly because 
100 years later, you do not know what people will be using your specimens for, and then you don't want to inform the wrong things. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm showing the distribution map of a particular species of KTDs. So in the past, taxonomy, when they did their revision, they can only tell you that they are found in Southeast Asia, uh, but they do not know how it is distributed within Southeast Asia. So by using uh, specimen data, we run through this program. So what this program do is that it looks at the locality information, um, and then they try and map it onto um, environmental layers, lay data, environmental data, and then they do some correlation, and then it tells you that uh, where they can be where they can be distributed within the region. So it's not as uniformly distributed as what people have thought previously. So some species, have, uh, some places have high probability of this species occurring, whereas some places are uh, not really. So uh, this tool is pretty useful, but at the same time it's very new. So um, people are still debating what is the best method to do, what is, what is the way to uh, do it properly and accurately. And um, this, this technique has been used a lot in conservation biology because they can actually map distribution for rare species. So that, that can help with conservation planning. So there are applications for these, these ecological methods. Um, get back to my PhD thesis, finally. Um, so what, um, my PhD thesis consists of ecology and behavior. So these are two science, two areas of science that is um, what we consider more advanced than taxonomy or natural history. Uh, because they use stats, uh, they use fancy, fancy uh, analysis, analytic tools, um, but before I can actually do all these ecological and um, behavioral experiments and so on, um, I need to know what species fit on what flowers. And then uh, actually nobody knows about it. So before I started my work, um, there are like five species of autopteran feeding on flowers from the world. That's what we have, we have known previously. But even within Southeast Asia, I have already found 40 plus species and then that is only based on a few study sites. So it is something that nobody actually take note of. Um, so uh, by, by going through surveys and natural history observations, it actually helps a lot for me, uh, or for anyone who, who, who wants to work on the ecology of behavior of species. <clears throat> and so in this process, it actually allows me to find, find out that actually autopterans also helps to pollinate uh, flowers. Uh, that is something that people don't associate with. So the second part, which is a small part of uh, my talk, which is to co uh, it's on communication. How communication can improve bioinformatics. Or it's actually a, a, a cyclical argument. Uh, how can bioinformatics be used to improve communication? So in Singapore, we have this website called the Bio Biodiversity of Singapore website. Uh, it's actually a portal that um, that we deposit specimen of uh, deposit images of um, specimens or species uh, onto this website, which is available to everyone. So, in for each species, you can actually click on it, and then it will tell you some information. Uh, the more we know about the species, the more we can put on the website, and then it um, we can know more about it. So I can actually show you. All. You can see that uh, there are many species. Different, different organisms, plants and animals. So if I'm interested in autoptera, I can just go to insect. Uh, look for look for autopterans. And then say I'm interested in this species. I can have a picture. And this picture is actually uh you can actually zoom in. So it's you can actually zoom in high resolution. It's meant to be high resolution. Uh, if you have information on biology and ecology, you can find them, external links. So um, this is a work done by our museum. So um, um, the aim is to, to document all the theses that can be found in Singapore. And then um, provide as many information that is available to everyone uh, in, in this website. Um,
So this is one way that communication can improve bioinformatics or how it can help people to gain access to bioinformatics. Uh, instead of someone having to look through papers after papers, they can just use this website um, and just click the click. Uh, it's a lot more interactive than reading uh, text after text. Um, it's also easy for um, beginners or amateurs to use um, that may not have access or they might not understand technical terms. Um, the second author or database that I would like to share is actually something more specific to autoptorance, which is the autoptera species file. So it is something that I, I use uh, almost every day uh, for my work because it provides impo important information that I need for my work. So this is more for, um, for people who do research um, in, in autoptorance. Um, I can do search. So this requires information. It requires the, the user to have some knowledge uh, about the species that they want to find. So, um, for example, so for example, I want to find species with the name from the start. And actually, I'm interested in this particular species. Um, what it provides is it, again, it's a portal where people can deposit information about the species. So um, people have deposit sound. So if you need, you want to hear how how, how it sounds like. You click on it. Uh, you have a distribution map, <coughs> some specimen record, uh, information about the type species, and to me the most useful thing is the the citation. So if you want to know more about the species, be it the original description or other works that have been done, uh, you can just come to this website and then some. Some papers, they actually have the paper is actually open access. Um, you can actually click on it and then it goes straight to the paper. So it's very convenient for us. Um, if, I, if I want to know, if I want to do work on this particular genus, uh, I can just click on the genus and I will know how many species there are. I can look through every species. If there are. Some of them has pictures, so it helps with my taxonomy work and identification work. So this is a um, again, this is making things, making complex or multiple information more easily accessible to everyone. So, last part of my talk is just talking about what I've been doing for the past few days. So, it's uh, hot from the press. I have, there's nothing, nothing technical or anything mm -hmm. that um, no result I can show so far. Uh, so I went to Sagal and then uh, did some surveys in um, coconut coconut um, habitat and um, within two days we can count of find about 22 mofo species uh, about four hours worth of uh, sampling. Um, so this is an example of a KTD feeding on flowers again. Um, these two are kittidates that are probably predatory. So one of them, we actually spotted them feeding on uh, a snail. Um, this, is a, this is a species that is very common uh, across half Asia. nature. Uh, it's a very huge kittidate. Um, but it, it has an interesting story about it. So even though it's widely distributed, we found out that uh, different individuals produce very different songs. So we can we, we call it dialects. It's like our dialects. We have different dialects, it sounds different. So for a long time nobody knows exactly whether these different dialects are they different species or are they the same species. So it's still a work in progress. Uh, nobody knows the answer yet. So yeah. Um, I'm also here working on the specimen that is found in the collection. So uh, my aim here is to actually take images, try to identify them, and then upload them onto website so that people can access uh, and look at them. So here is just an example of what I do. I take an image, uh, a very raw image, and then I edit it into something more pleasant looking. Uh, and then using this website, uh, using this, this picture, I can deposit, uh, I can uh, upload it in the website. Yeah. Um, I think that's about it. So I just want to thank um, <coughs> the university that I come from, uh, different agencies that um, 
that hosted me in my trip around Southeast Asia as well as uh, the Apatera species file which uh, provide me the money to come here.